um, so this uh, talk is about the history of um, what we now call Brixton Windmill and um, how it has survived uh, through the Industrial Revolution, two world wars to become what it is now, I think it's fair to say, a very much loved community asset in Lambeth. To start with, I'm just going to show you a map of what is roughly the area that we now call Lambeth and the distribution of windmills that, there, that existed during the time when the Brixton windmill, which you can see there in the center, um, was uh, active during the um, 19th and into the 20th century. Uh, what you can see is that there's a cluster of windmills along the, the river, and these tended to be, some of them were flour mills like the Brixton windmill uh, was, but a lot of them were also industrial mills. And then there's a range of them of windmills, which were more likely to be um, uh, flour mills on the higher ground as you move south um, uh, beyond Brixton itself. This is the only photo that we have of Brixton Windmill during its wind power period. And that lasted from 1816 through to 1862 when the family firm of Ashby and Sons uh, all through that period of town time ground flour and traded from the mill in, on Brixton Hill. It's what's known as a tower mill, um, a brick tower mill. And it is 14, nearly 15 meters high. It's round and it's uh, the diameter at the bottom of the mill is six and a half, just over six and a half meters at its base. And it tapers to nearly four meters at the top, 3.65 meters at the top. And it's built of brick, London stock bricks laid in a Flemish style. And it was traditionally coated in tar to protect it from the weather. At the very top, you can see the wooden weatherboard cap, which rotates to carry the sails the four sails, traditionally called sweeps when you're um, south of uh, the Thames, carry them round to face the wind. Originally, all four sails were common sails. That means these, uh, the, that one on the top right there is a common sail. That means they had um, sailcloth on them that would be furled or unfurled as on a sailing boat when um, uh, not required uh, to catch the wind. But by the mid 1820s, uh, two sails were changed to patent sails. That is, these are the ones here um, from the top left down to the bottom right, which um, should have shutters on them. They don't have shutters on them in this picture, which leads us to believe this was photograph was taken at the very end of the time when the windmill was working by wind power. Um, these have been restored uh, more recently as spring sails. There are different types of windmills that you can see in England, uh, and I just briefly, quickly go through these. Um, the uh, most simple type is what you see here on uh, where my pointer is, the post mill at Bourne Windmill. That means that the entire edifice, the entire structure, turns on one main uh, post. And in order to move the sails to face the wind, people have to push, or maybe an animal was used, to, a donkey or something, to turn the entire structure around. And they are wood and they're pretty unstable and they often blew down. Uh, development on that um, type of uh, wooden mill is the smock mill. And this um, image here in the top right uh, is a rather lovely sepia watercolor wash uh, from 1804, uh, which is actually one of the mills in Lambeth, uh, a mill on Marsh Road. And it is, um, is described in, as a mill in, in Lambeth Marsh Road on the left leaving Westminster Bridge. Um, this is an eight-sided wooden smock mill of three storeys built on a three-storey wooden base. And as you can see, it's got a stage running round it uh, above the, um, the, the three-storey uh, base. And that's to enable the uh, miller uh, to reach the sails and to uh, sort out things like sailcloths and so on. Uh, this was a uh, mill was um, has a, 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 a an OG shaped uh, cap with a small gable at, to house the, the winding mechanism at the back and you can see the ropes and chains you just about see them here coming down so that the miller who worked could be on this platform that goes round the edge of the, uh, the stage that goes round the outside of the mill and operate to pull the cap round to face into the wind. 
And then the, you have the third style, which is the much more stable style, which is the style of our mill at Brixton, which is a brick tower with a wooden cap on top. And it benefit of this kind of mill is that it does, um, could withstand fire, flour being very combustible. So one of the other hazards not only was blowing it down in strong winds, but also burning down if the fire, if the um, flour uh, uh, caught a light. Okay, so um, the records show, and the last point to make is that the other 11 mills that once worked in Lambeth all predate the Ashby's mill on Brixton Hill. So the real issue for us is why did our mill survive? And uh, I want, to, this is the main uh, argument that's going to be made in this talk. Uh, why did the others all disappear during the 19th century? And why did Brixton Windmill, as we now call it, survive and go on to produce flour up until uh, 1934? Uh, and that was, um, there were big challenges uh, to windmills uh, surviving uh, the, through, right through the 19th century and into the 20th century, because late in the 18th century, of course, you had the rise of factory production and the Albion mills, which were built on the uh, bank of the Thames uh, um, near Blackfriars, um, was the first great factory in London. And it was a flour mill and it was constructed uh, and was considered at the time to be one of the industrial wonders of the time. It was powered by steam engines and it could grind 10 bushels of wheat per hour on 20 pairs of millstones. Well, the maximum number of millstones you could get in most mills would probably be two pairs, uh, unless they were really very large uh, windmills. Um, so factory production and steam engines dry, powering the, uh, the, the millstones was a massive threat to traditional wind and water powered mills. And uh, here we see the fate of that um, uh, mill, uh, the Albion mills. In fact, it burnt down on March the 2nd, 1791. And the belief was that it was disgruntled uh, water and windmillers who actually set fire to it because they saw it as such a great a threat. Um, there was one other hazard that the or, or problem that faced the um, uh, anybody trying to start uh, a milling business in 1816, as the Ashby family who leased the mill that we now call Brixton uh, Windmill uh, did, and that was the uh, introduction of the um, tariffs and restrictions on imported um, uh, was was the rise of trade of uh, grain across um, uh, the world and the um, fact that foreign grain, foreign wheat grain, uh, tended to be much harder than English wheat uh, grain and was more difficult for the traditional millers to um, mill, uh, hence the impetus uh, for of business to uh, try and get the industrialized mills uh, built at the time. But the Corn Laws first um, introduced um, uh, in 1815 uh, was actually a help to traditional millers because it did bring in restrictions and tariffs on imported wheat. Um, but the other thing that we have to consider when we uh, look at the history of the Brixton windmill is where it was sited. Um, it was sited in open land and uh, the two acres of land containing a corn mill and associated buildings that the 45 year old Quaker John Ashby leased in November 1817 had been part of the manor of Stockwell and the land was still rural. It had been sold off in packages in 1802 and was part of, uh, part of it was purchased by a, a merchant of Southwark called Christopher Crystal Hall. He then leased the plot number 84 to John Ashby which was basically a plot three quarters of the way up Brixton Hill on the, um, uh, on the west side uh, of the uh, Brixton Hill Road, the, what we now know as the A23, but not on the top of the, of the hill. And therefore the southwesterly winds that would blow towards um, uh, the mill and would drive the, wind, the uh, sails was it were actually slightly barred and slightly um, out of, you know, it wasn't really the best position for because it. There's and there's a one of the reasons uh, we have to uh, question Windmill. is why wasn't uh, the Brixton windmill at the top of the hill? Well, that's because there already was one there. And then what we're looking at now uh, on this rather delightful watercolor from 1818 uh, near Brixton Hill, windy day is actually the mill that stood at the top of the hill. And this was known as Upper Mill and it's, 
basically was positioned on the area at, just near the top of Brixton Hill where the South Circular is now, just near there, and on a road that we now call Morish Road. And it was near a farm, which you can see um, in the distance with its washing blowing in the, uh, in the, on the windy day. Um, it was um, known as the Upper Hill, uh, Bleak Hall Farm and the mill itself, which you can see is a smock mill, um, a wooden smock mill that actually um, uh, was um, uh, known as the Upper Mill. And hence the Brixton Mill couldn't really be at the top of the hill. It had a rival there already. And so the Ashby's leased a mill uh, on what we now call Blenheim Gardens, Cornwall Road, the plot of land stretched from Cornwall Road south and west. And uh, he paid, he signed a lease, Ashby, John Ashby signed the lease uh, on plot 84. Uh, he, John Ashby, the first Brixton uh, uh, miller, uh, first miller, sorry, at Brixton Windmill, he signed the lease uh, in November 1817, but it said on the lease, uh, the lease was signed from Christmas Day now past. So in fact, the lease ran from December 1816 for the full term of 99 years at a yearly rent of 31 pound, 10 shillings payable quarterly. John Ashby's um, grandchildren uh, claimed in the 20th century that he had built the windmill himself, but it's much more likely that his half brother, William Ashby, um, of um, Kent, an established millwright, designed and oversaw the building for Crystal Hall in anticipation of the land. I'm just going to go back and look at our mill uh, 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 so that you'll see what I'm talking about. He designed the mill, designed the mill in, and probably arranged to build it for Crystal Hall, or at least to oversee the building of it. Building of it, and it's a ten, a, 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 as I said before, a brick tower mill with a inverted well uh, with the, with the weatherboarded cap looks a bit like an inverted boat which is the Kentish style and um, William Ashby who was in fact half brother of John um, was a traditional millwright and he had designed mills like this elsewhere so the lease was signed and we don't know why whether whether um, what actually motivated John Ashby, no records survive from the 118 years that the Ashby's ran their milling business, unfortunately. Maybe John had already decided he wanted to develop a milling business in Brixton, or maybe his half brother William encouraged him to take on the lease uh, as he had been involved in building, uh, building the mill for Crystal Hall. Uh, anyhow, these, um, moving back again quickly to where we were, um, these two pens, these two early representations of the Ashby's windmill both show the mill cottage, uh, which was part of the um, buildings when, when, he, when John signed the lease in 1817, it said it was for a plot of land, about almost two acres, um, and a corn mill already built, and various other buildings, uh, associated buildings, and these were primarily the mill cottage, which you can see here in the pencil drawing and here in the watercolour and various other buildings uh, clustered around the base of the windmill. And some of these probably were developed once they had moved on to the site. Interestingly, you can see that at this stage in uh, of the, when the pencil drawing was um, uh, done, there is actually a stage around the base of the Brixton windmill, uh, which is no longer there, of course. Um, so uh, these two early representations, as I say, both show the mill cottage, uh, one of the buildings mentioned in the lease, and um, uh, but they also show that it's still, although there are a number of buildings around, it's still, as we saw from the previous uh, uh, watercolor of the area to the north, south and west of the uh, of the Brixton Mill, there is still quite a lot of open land. And this map um, verifies this. If you can see the map on the left-hand side here, here is the windmill. Can you just see it says windmill? This map must have been uh, made after 1819 because that was the year when the Brixton, what we call Brixton Prison, the penitentiary uh, called when it was being built, the Surrey House of Correction, was built just to the south of um, uh, the Ashby's property. This is Cornwall Road, later known as um, uh, Blenheim Gardens. This is the area where the windmill is now, and now the 
windmill stood and is now the footprint of the park. This is Brixton Hill coming up from uh, Cold Harbour Lane, you can see here, Acre Lane there, Brixton Hill, Brixton Water Lane going across here. And basically the area around is still very open, just a string of rather large houses as you come up uh, the hill. And then when you go past the, the uh, prison and you come up to where the upper mill, uh, upper windmill is, a Brixton upper mill, here is the is Bleak Lane where the farm was, where we saw the saw the um, uh, watercolor. So there's a settlement there on the brow of the hill, and then you go on open space until you come to Streatham. So you can see that the area is pre pretty uh, um, like the representation in the watercolor uh, of the upper hill, um, Brixton. So back to our mill um, and the flower business at Brixton Hill. John, his wife, Hannah, who came from Seven Oaks in Kent and their family of six children lived in the mill cottage, which we can see in this photograph here. Um, and uh, the photo, as I said, probably dates from um, 1862, the end of the flower production powered by wind at Brixton. Already no shutters on the, sale, on the patent sales, as I pointed out earlier. The census of 1841 records that John, then 65, his wife, Hannah, 60, and, their th and three of their children, they had six children in all, three of their children, including, including Aaron, age 30, who was a miller like his father, were all living at Brixton Lower Mill. And we already know, and we know that the oldest son, also called John after his father, were, had already moved away and was a well-established miller at Carl Sholton in Surrey. So the family were a family of millers. They were a Quaker family, and um, John himself was quite a, a, a dedicated Quaker. There are a number of tracts that he wrote about the problems of the rural poor in, uh, you, you can read in the um, uh, center for, um, uh, of the Quaker center on, e on Euston Road um, uh, to this day. Soon after 1841, we know that John built himself a much more substantial villa at the entrance to their property, further away from the mill yard and uh, the mill cottage. But by the time, and by the time of the next census, uh, the mill cottage was occupied only by mill workers and servants, some of whom had come from Hannah's family in Kent to work for the Brixton uh, Ashby family, who were the owners of the business. The new house that, um, had, uh, that um, John had built has been described as a double-fronted Georgian villa. Unfortunately, no, at least we've never been able to find any um, images of that um, um, building, which is a real shame. The Ashby's mill, milling business experienced financial problems during the, its first 50 years. In 1819, we know that John took out a mortgage on the entire property, which was not redeemed until much later in the century. Records also show that in 1823, he was in debt to his half-brother, William. Uh, we know that in 1836, John brought a legal action against the Lambeth Waterworks, who had... Um, taken, um, been developed in the space in just immediately south of Brixton Windmill um, between uh, the windmill property and the uh, prison. And the um, action that uh, he took was because uh, he felt, he, he said that the waterworks had stopped a water course and injured his premises. And although he won the case, uh, the legal expenses and the time involved must have been a financial a burden to him. To ease these financial burdens, John made an agreement with local builder, John Muggeridge, to let the eastern half of his property uh, to allow seven villas to be built on uh, facing on to Cornwall Road, now Blenheim Gardens. And Michael Short, who wrote a book in, a 18, in 1971, about published in 1971, about all the Lambeth windmills, um, he points out that this decision to um, let that part of his eastern part of his property and to allow more buildings to be built on it was sort of in the immediate vicinity of the windmill, hastened the problem that uh, was increasingly developing for the Ashbys and their, um, their, their, their family business. Uh, because what was happening in those first years of their business was a great increase in the number of buildings that were being built around them. And that came primarily from the development of the railways across South London 
which totally transformed Brixton Hill as, as it did many other parts of southern London, uh, south of London. And it certainly threatened the future of Brixton Windmill and the Ashby's ability to mill flour uh, from uh, the windmill. John died in 1845 and his business passed on to a succession of his sons. But by the mid 1850s, it was being run by Joshua uh, Ashby, who had been born uh, in Brixton and uh, lived on to, to 1888. He was born in, in 1821. We know that in 1859, Joshua was in business with uh, a family called the Shoal family, who were bakers based in Dulwich Road, Brixton. And indeed, there was a marriage uh, between um, John's second youngest son, Amos, uh, Joshua's brother, uh, who later became a miller himself at Wallingham. Uh, he, married in, he married into the Shoal family. The year after John's death in 1845 had seen the abolition of the restrictions and tariffs imported uh, uh, on imported wheat known as the Corn Laws that were first introduced in 1815. And so foreign wheat began to arrive in British ports in much greater quantities. And again, that was a challenge for um, traditional windmills, um, both stone, uh, wind powered and um, water powered, because as I said before, these new varieties were a harder grain that came from overseas. They could not um, so easily be ground by the, by the stones uh, uh, driven by wind power or water power. They really needed the um, extra power that came from steam and different forms of, um, of milling. And the other thing that was happening at this time was that a new roller mill process was, had been invented in Hungary in 1834. And by 1848, steel roller mills were running there and in Switzerland, driven by steam engines. And again, this new technology was beginning to become an increasing threat to England's traditional corn mills. So how did the Ashby's adapt to this new industrialization of the mid 19th century? It wasn't easy for them. They were using the traditional methods developed in the rural world. And from, the, from this uh, detail of the map of the area immediately around their um, property, here's the windmill in red. This is the space of their mill yard. These are the properties that they'd allowed to be developed on their own, the eastern part of their property. And to the north, you can see there are rows and rows and rows of um, uh, densely built um, with, uh, uh, workers' cottages. Uh, between the, into the immediate south, you've got the buildings of the Lambeth Waterworks and a big, a big reservoir, which later became a covered reservoir. And then you've got the prison. On Brixton Hill, you've got still the large houses, still a certain amount of open land to the left, uh, to the, uh, uh, the west, sorry. And, uh, but still the building, the windmill is now more and more surrounded by, by, building, by buildings. And that was blocking the wind that could flow to drive the sails. So, um, and as I say, that was impacted uh, and made worse by the development of the uh, railways. Um, London Bridge Station had opened in 1836, Waterloo in 1848, and in 1856, Streatham Station, which we now know as Streatham Hill, was opened and followed later in 1862 by Clapham Station, Brixton Station, and Hearn Hill Station. All these new railway lines and uh, intersections were enabling people to travel um, to, uh, easily into central London and, and live out in the suburb of Brixton. So, how did the Ashbys respond to this? Well, in 1862, Joshua Ashby, who was uh, by then leading the uh, family business, um, made the decision that flour milling part of their business had to be moved, had to be moved to Mitcham where he could rent water mills. And indeed he signed a lease on a water mill on the River Wandle for 40 years. He argued that the water of the river would be a constant power of uh, source, something that was no longer available from wind on Brixton Hill. So what was the fate of Brixton Windmill? Well, it was stripped of its milling machinery. The sails were removed in 1864. Uh, much of the machinery was probably sold on. Maybe some of it was transferred to the water mill in um, uh, Amitcham. But the family did decide to continue to live in Brixton and to trade. The, the new transport uh, links meant that they could trade also from two sites. And this uh, nice colorful um, uh, advertisement for Joshua uh, Ashby and Sons, 
millers and corn mer merchants printed in 1897 uh, shows that they were trading, as it says, from Brixton Hill and Mitcham. Um, it's interesting to note that in 1897, the family were already um, utilizing their rural past, a rural past which really had hardly existed. Uh, you've got this rather idyllic uh, view of cornfields uh, in the center of this uh, highly decorated cart. And um, uh, the flour that they were selling from both Brixton and um, uh, Mitcham was not um, being um, uh, produced in a, in a rural setting at all. The River Wandle at that time was the most polluted river in England. Uh, it was a highly industrialized river. And by the time the Ashby's 40 lease, uh, year lease on the watermill was coming to an end, the, the la very large number of uh, water mills on the river, which were not just flour mills, but were doing all sorts of things like um, uh, leather, leather work or grinding um, uh, other kinds of powders, mustard and so on, uh, doing um, powering uh, sawmills and other semi-industrialized processes. Um, that the, the actual flow of the water in the Wanda was uh, compromised as well, and uh, it was very erratic. So in um, 1902, when the Ashby's 40-year uh, lease on their water mill at Mitchum was coming to an end, uh, the Joshua seized and the opportunity to, of new technical developments, or his sons, his grand, his sons, the, the third generation of, of Ashby's, um, to uh, look at a new development that had uh, been uh, developed for and was being used by the more traditional um, uh, millers. And that was to use steam power to drive a more modern uh, and more compact uh, form of um, a set of stones. And um, that's indeed what uh, they did. In 1902, the uh, John Ashby's grandsons, who are now in charge of the Brixton uh, Ashby's flour milling business, did not renew the lease at uh, Mitcham. They returned to uh, Brixton Hill. They decided to buy this a new modern set of stones powered by a steam engine and relocate flour milling back to Brixton. And this uh, image here on the top left, taken before the main restoration we had done in 2010, shows that uh, um, modular mill in a rather sorry state, but it is the one that was put in in 1902. Uh, much more compact, had a pair of French birthstones that um, could um, uh, produce a very fine, good quality wholemeal flour. And that indeed is what we do, we use today at, at Brixton. Um, uh, the steam flat driver um, was very, very efficient, much more efficient than the, the French burr stones were much uh, better at grinding the flour than the Derbyshire grey millstones that had been driven by the wind power from 1816 to 1862. It sits, this new modular mill sits on an Ironhurst frame. Uh, they installed it on the first floor of the old brick tower uh, of, the, of the Brixton windmill, the one that they had stripped of all its sails. You can see images of it here, both here in this later photograph from the 1950s and here in this um, hand uh, tinted uh, postcard from 1906. You can see there is the windmill without its sails. Interestingly, it has a, 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 a platform appears to have been built round the base of the tower. You can see it in both images. And that was obviously a viewing platform. Now, why it was built, was it built so that they could raise money by letting people climb up and look out over London? Or was it uh, in, um, established there because, um, because the, uh, um, uh, of the threat of war the, at the time of the um, uh, conflict with the French in the, um, uh, during the 19th century? We don't know, but there it is, a, a viewing platform at the base of the um, cap. A larger door has been cut in the end of the cap uh, to allow people to walk out onto it. And if you look really carefully here, you can actually see that there is a sort of barrier to stop them falling off. Um, you can also see that um, by the time of the 1906 postcard, gas seems to have been available um, on Cornwall Road. And we do know that later 
the steam engine was replaced by a, a gas engine to uh, power the modular mill. So as I say, the, next, the, the third generation of the Ashby's were in charge of the family business, Bernard Gideon, uh, and a brother and his brother, Joshua John. And uh, they continued to provide flour to local bakeries, shops, and those who came to the mill yard. Um, here's a publicity leaflet, front and back on the left here, um, of a leaflet the family produced in 1914. Uh, to show the range of uh, things that they were selling. So it wasn't just flour, um, both for stone ground flour, pastry white flour, best household flour, and so on. They also sold wheat meal and corn flour, tapioca, semolina, all sorts of stuff which they must have had to buy in. And they sold eggs. And there's this rather lovely photograph of a girl at Brixton Hill uh, taken from the, which we found in the Mills Archive, Archive Trust collection um, with the chickens uh, that produce the eggs. But going back to the leaflet itself on the left here, uh, it's interesting that they call it the old mill and um, uh, the old mill still stands as in the picture except for the sales which were removed in 1862 and so on. Flour and wheat meal are produced by the stone process, which is advised and recommended by the most eminent medical men of the day. All our poultry foods are specially prepared by expert knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So they're still trading on the idea of the ye old mill at Brixton Hill. After his brother died in 1925, uh, Joshua, John, continued to manage the business. Um, the family had leased the, well, I'll just go back actually while I talk about this. The family had leased um, the property for 99 years in uh, 1816. And 98 years later, they actually bought the, lead, the freehold of the land and mill associate and associated buildings. Uh, they were able to do that. They obviously bought it because they anticipated keeping the business going. They paid £2,000 and interestingly at that time the, uh, the property had been said, um, freehold had been sold on and on and it was currently owned at that time by Middlesex Hospital and as I say they paid £2,000 for the freehold. But it was still quite hard to keep a traditional flour milling business profitable in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, just to explain this a bit, um, in 1887, the Association of British and Irish Millers had reported that while the population in Britain rose from 18 million in 1851 to 26 million 30 years later, the number of workers in mills had dramatically fallen uh, from 36,000 to 23,000. And that in that year, 1887, there were only 8,814 traditional mills remaining. And that during the period of the change um, uh, and drop in uh, the number of um, mills, uh, 460 new roller mills had been opened and imported flour was now used for 75% of all bread baked in uh, the UK in 1887. So that is quite a dramatic change. And uh, the war that came after they installed the um, new modular mill in 1902, the, the Great War of 1914-18 and its immediate aftermath was yet another period when a very large number of wind and water mills closed. So in this environment, Ashby and Sons did pretty well to maintain their business right up to 1934, which was when Joshua John finally closed it down on his retirement. He had never married. Uh, he had um, uh, lived uh, with, um, in the mill house with his housekeeper, uh, someone called Marion Johnson Marshall. Now she had been with the family since 1901 when she was recorded uh, as a boarder and companion to Joshua John's widowed mother. Joshua was, a, as I say, um, a bachelor. He was not an active um, Quaker, any uh, it, he, although he still was a Quaker, he wasn't an active Quaker. His hobby was uh, botany. He was a member of the Royal Botanical Society and he um, was reputed to keep a very interesting garden. 
When he died uh, in 1935, it was Marion Marshall who continued to live in the Mill House right up until 1952. Now, the um, newspaper cuttings on the right indicates the fact that during the 1930s, there had been a lot of interest in the windmill and a number of newspaper articles about a working windmill in London, the, the strangeness of having a working windmill in a London suburb. And we know that before his death in 1935, a year after he uh, closed the business, Joshua John had told his solicitor that he really wanted the mill to be preserved as, quote, a relic of bygone days for future generations. Um, even before his um, death, Lambeth Borough Council were interested in the fact that there was this mill in uh, the borough on Brixton Hill. And they had asked uh, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, SPAB, to consider some sort of joint action to secure uh, the preservation of the building. And uh, there was a report produced for SPAB, which concluded that part, apart from the viewing stage at the top here, which you can see much more clearly in this uh, photograph uh, taken in 1937, uh, two years after uh, Joshua died, but uh, they said apart from that uh, cap, which they considered should be condemned as unsafe, they said the following, and I'm quoting here, the whole mill building can be thoroughly cleaned and put into first rate order for the sum of about 25 pounds. There is a range of outbuildings. The whole place would make a most excellent unemployment center or club premises. And I would like to suggest that this property be preserved. The mill is of great interest as being almost unique in London and is quite typical of the traditional practice of windmills built at the time of its erection. It would be a great pity if such a landmark of old Lambeth was destroyed. So that was the uh, opinion of SPAB and their um, uh, officers. Both the London Borough of Lambeth and the London County Council, which was the governing body for London at that time, were interested in preserving the mill as a building of historic importance. However, they felt that the trustees, um, Joshua John had left his business in trust um, uh, in the hope that something like, uh, that it would be preserved. Uh, and he left the, uh, the He'd allowed his housekeeper to remain living in the, in the mill house until the trust um, resolved what would be done with the property. Um, but the LCC and the London Borough of Lambeth both felt that the trustees demand of 9,500 for the whole property was much too high. So there was no action taken. And then of course, World War II came quite shortly after and for six years, preserving the windmill was not a priority for anybody. But, uh, post-war, there was another threat to the windmill, um, which <clears throat> was because there was a great shortage of land in <clears throat> London for building, and there was a great need for house, uh, a very big and uh, widespread house building program. And so there were threats to um, uh, the Ashby property uh, and the Trust's property because um, there was a demand that, you know, there was a belief that they should, the mill should be pulled down and the land, that uh, open space of land should be used for new housing. Fortunately, you, um, for those who did, weren't in need of housing anyhow, um, in 1951, Lambeth Civic Society successfully campaigned for Brixton Windmill to be listed. That meant the Ministry of Works put an order on it that it could not be um, uh, pulled down. And eventually, in 1957, the London County Council decided to buy the windmill and agreed to pay for its um, uh, stabilisation and making it secure if Lambeth Council created a public park, park around the mill. And this slide here is the outcome of that development. You've got on the right hand side 1950s press reports about the campaign to restore the uh, uh, bricks and women, which got into the Daily Telegraph and Morning Post and uh, on two different occasions. And um, in uh, the eventually, as I say, the LCC bought the property uh, and the cottage and outbuildings were demolished in, and in 1963. Um, the Maybe park was laid or out or and, in, and a, a millwright from um, Lincolnshire was uh, started to restore the windmill. 
Uh, some of the gas driven machinery was removed, but the Hearst um, frame uh, modular mill remained inside. Uh, later on, uh, further restoration work was done. Um, uh, Mr. Thompson had, uh, Alec, uh, had found that there was a, a mill being a similar, very similar design tower mill being demolished in Burley Marsh in Lincolnshire and machinery, mill ma uh, wind powered wind mill machinery was obtained from there and brought to Brixton and reinstalled inside the, um, uh, the windmill tower, the Brixton tower. And new sales were made eventually to match those shown in the pre-1864 photograph that we're familiar with um, from uh, earlier in, the, in this talk. Uh, the major restoration was completed in 1968 when the mill was opened for visits inside. So this is the re fully restored um, windmill in 1968. Uh, two sets of sales have been put on. Um, you've got the ones that would normally have had traditionally had the sail cloth on it. And these ones here, which were the patent sails that should have shutters in each of these uh, spaces. Uh, they weren't fitted at that time. And indeed, no shutters were fitted until uh, the major restoration in 2010. What's interesting is that uh, some of the old um, um, buildings uh, on Cornwall Road are still there, or now in Blenheim Gardens and they haven't yet been knocked down to, um, uh, for the construction of the Blenheim Gardens uh, Council Estate, which now borders the park at that side. There is also here um, a hut, quite a substantial hut, which was uh, built beside the windmill when the days when there were park keepers and the park keeper would also open the windmill for the visitors who could pay one and six to go up, up inside the mill uh, when he was on site. Uh, in those days, they, they weren't expected to be take, taken, there weren't the health and safety uh, concerns that there are nowadays, and uh, they were allowed to wander through the windmill on their own, uh, but he was uh, standing by in the hut, um, which um, is roughly where we've got our new building, but I'll come to that later. Unfortunately, well, the, the, the windmill was later transferred um, to uh, the ownership of the Lambeth Council, Cal County, the Lambeth Council from the LCC. That happened in uh, 1971. And of course, to this day, the windmill is the property and uh, 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 as is the park, windmill gardens of the council, and they're responsible for both the windmill structure and its maintenance. And uh, they're supposed to also look after windmill gardens. Um, unfortunately, over the 30 years following uh, that transfer of the property, the windmill fell into periods of neglect, dereliction, and in between it underwent further restoration and repair of the tower and the cap. Here you can see um, a cutting from 1978 showing that the cap was having to have work done. Here is a cutting from the South London Press, press of eight, uh, 1982 talking about the fact that the vandals had hit uh, the windmill and there's a rather nasty racist um, sign there from the National Front and uh, painted on, the, wall, on, the, on the, the, the fencing that had been put round the, the, the windmill because it was not um, uh, in good order and another photo from 1982 showing scaffolding around the windmill in one of the attempts to uh, uh, get it back into better use. However, um, the poor state of affairs um, continued um, and in by 19, the late 1990s, the windmill was in really serious disrepair. Um, and in 2002, in fact, it was put on the um, English Heritage's Building at Risk Register and uh, there was graffiti, the interior of the windmill was in a very bad state. And this spurred local people to take some action and decide that they needed to do something about the windmill, which they had, many people had fond memories of from their childhood when they had been able to go into the mill and uh, visit it. And in 2003, the Friends of Windmill Gardens group was formed with three aims to restore and reopen the windmill, to improve the surrounding part, which, is, which, which was in a pretty sorry state at that time, and to develop an education center building to support the windmill that could be used by the local community group. 
uh, local, local community and local groups. And in that sense, they were sort of going back to the ideas that had been put forward by SPAB back in the 1930s. Um, over the next period of time, the um, Friends began a program of increasingly popular annual sports and family fun events in the park and across uh, arguing for the, their case across different fora in Lambeth to raise awareness and gain support from local residents. And that included opening the mill on um, uh, open house weekends. Uh, the council cooperated on that. They would open all the shutters, uh, all the trap doors on each floor of the windmill inside uh, so that people could go inside and only stand on the ground floor, but could look up and see some of the interior of the windmill. Um, interestingly, in this photograph here, which was taken at our very first festival when students from the Camberwell School of Art uh, raised an enormous sun, paper sunflower up on the windmill to sort of uh, draw attention to it. Uh, you can see to the left here of the building of the windmill, the remnants of the old um, park keeper's hut burnt out. You can see the rafters of the burnt out building. Uh, and you can also see more graffiti on, on the stay and play or the one o'clock club that had been built um, on the other side of the windmill at that, uh, uh, during the 80s and 90s. Um, in 2010, we finally were successful and a, um, a generous grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, the council and the friends of Windmill Gardens had applied uh, once before, but they eventually on the second application got a, were successful in getting a grant, uh, which along with financial um, and in-kind contributions from Lambeth Council and the Friends funded a major restoration and the full cost of that uh, restoration project was 581,000 plus pounds. Uh, and in, it also included the employment of a um, uh, part-time development and education officer up until 2015. Um, lots of problems had to be uh, resolved. Um, uh, there was um, lots of damage uh, on the building. Floorboards you can see here have had to be completely replaced uh, along with the beams that held them up. The sails were taken off um, uh, and the millwright uh, was employed to uh, uh, repair the sails. They were taken to the workshop down in Reading and then returned fully uh, repaired. Lots of the, the, all the mill machinery inside, uh, the, particularly the wooden um, uh, structure was um, uh, checked and, and uh, uh, repaired. Um, and at that was, this was the time when on the spring, on the, what were, had been the patent sales and were now converted to spring sales, he also fit, fitted shutters. So now if you visit Brixton Windmill, you will see shutters on those sales. The entire windmill was wrapped in a plastic, oh, it was very bad weather that winter. But the end result, as you can see here on the right, was a beautifully restored interior, uh, lots of new wood replacing old, but left to weather in uh, over time. And um, in 2011, the windmill was able to be opened. And this was the um, celebration in May to open the windmill. We decided, we were, the Friends of Windmill Gardens decided along with the first development and education officer who'd been employed as part of the HLF grant, uh, to try to organise a, a small parade up Brixton Hill to a festival that we were holding in the park to celebrate the opening. Um, the small parade turned into about 2,000 people coming up the hill. We were quite overwhelmed and they attended the uh, ceremony. Uh, lots of the different elements of activity by the friends. We had a, a, a group who formed themselves into the Windmill Theatre Company and they joined the parade and they did a performance at the celebration. And the actual ribbon around the windmill, we've had a great big rib ribbon uh, circling, circling the entire base of the windmill was cut by the great, 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 great grandson of the original miller, John Ashby. Um, Henry, um, uh, Ashby had contacted us when he'd read in the newspapers that the windmill was being uh, restored. It was a great event. Um, following that, since the opening of the windmill in 2011, the friends have uh, done what they were supposed to do. They're all volunteers. They've opened the windmill to visitors during each summer 
uh, to provide guided tours. The only times we weren't able to open it was when the pandemic lockdown prevented us from doing so. We provide the guided tours to visitors. As you can see here, there's a, one of our um, guides who actually also, also is a descendant of the Ashby family, taking uh, local people around the outside before taking them inside the windmill to see all the um, workings of the mill. Uh, we supported the education program. This was the uh, development and education officer. He was delivering school workshops uh, in the stay in, in the one o'clock club next door, not in very good circumstances, a very crowded space, but he delivered and developed some very interesting uh, workshops for local child, school children and, and good relations with local schools. And the friends did also what they had been asked to do by the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund grantees, which is to continue to deliver, our, to deliver uh, community events in the park. Um, we uh, learned to make flour in 2014, and we now sell flour regularly. So we have about a group of our, our friends who are millers. Uh, we imp help improve the park, as you can see here, we worked with a student, a local, uh, a, an international student who came and developed this amazing mural that um, is painted all along one side of the children's playground in the park. And in 2016, we spent a year celebrating the 200th anniversary of Bricks and Windmill when a local designer um, at his own expense had um, a set of sailcloths made in a rather unusual and, and non-traditional jazz uh, pattern to enable the wind sails to turn uh, by wind power with sails um, uh, for, um, un, uh, stretched across the common sails or sweeps. Before the end of the um, uh, Her Heritage Lottery grant period, which was 2015, we had started uh, a discussion with a campaign with to persuade Lambeth Council to provide a building to enable the education program at Brixton Windmill to expand. In 2014, they said they uh, had they could provide 350,000 pounds for such a building, and uh, along toing and froing, um, which involved also uh, a local design uh, architects, uh, Squire and Partners, designing a, a, a rather beautiful, uh, submitting a very beautiful. Um, uh, design which they did pro bono for the build a new building and in eventually this building was built it opened um, in uh, 2020 the um, friends signed a lease and remember these friends are all still all volunteers the friends um, signed a lease for 20 years to manage this building and uh, this amazing new asset is now in existence here you can see it sitting very discreetly beside uh, the windmill, the beautifully restored windmill, facing out onto the park. The, the building interior is absolutely fabulous. It is, um, has this lovely wooden barn-like interior. At the back end of the, at the sort of east end of the building, we have an amazing kitchen, which um, has a baking oven so that we can uh, provide baking classes. The room is big, it can be used for school groups, can be used for local meetings, as you can see here, can be used for on open days when we've um, run baking classes for children. And it opens out onto the park, as you can see here, for, and we use it for uh, as a visitor center, as a work, as a space where school, work, uh, school groups can visit and take um, a class of 30, can easily do a, a workshop in uh, the center at the same, and also visit inside the windmill. And we can run lots of community events and activities here. It's an amazing um, new asset for our neighborhood. And now after all the pandemic restrictions are being lifted, uh, the Friends of Windmill Gardens, which was founded in 2003, became a charity in 2007, transformed to a charitable incorporated in in organization in 2018 in order to be able to employ some staff, now does employ two part-time members of staff to help manage the building. We are expanding our education program and establishing the new Brixton um, uh, Windmill Centre as a vibrant community hub centred around the amazing heritage of the 206 year old Brixton Windmill. We've been supported all along the way by our local community, helped by our local council and generous grant funding from different grant streams of the National Lottery as well as um, uh, funded by the National Lottery, as well as donations from our uh, other trusts and 
uh, trip donations from our local community, including a very successful crowdfunder that we wrote that we ran in 2018 in order to buy have the money to buy to to furnish this building uh, that we anticipated at that time would open in 2019. It didn't, in fact, open until much later. Um, and uh, we now have this uh, centre which we want to develop as a vibrant um, community hub centred around, around the heritage of the 206 year old uh, bricks and windmill. Um, so our aim is to expand our activities, um, which include health and well-being projects, as well as education, all inspired by this amazing survivor of Brixton's rural past. And um, we take um, note that what we have, we have actually achieved is sort of what was being discussed way back in uh, 1936 and we hope is in the spirit of what um, the last Miller at um, Brixton Windmill, Joshua John Ashby, wanted when he said he wanted the mill to remain a relic of Brixton's bygone age. And we hope also that uh, in some ways the ethos of uh, the first Miller, uh, who was concerned about the, the, uh, his, his local cities, uh, local people and the rural poor and how they should be treated better uh, in his uh, Quaker tracts, we hope that that also is sort of uh, imbuing the way we operate at Brixton Windmill. So that's Brixton Windmill, 1816 to 2022. We've now got a lease that runs for another 20 years and we hope that the windmill will be able to survive um, uh, uh, along with that new building long into the future and be a really good asset and a really great heritage site as we hope to develop it uh, for our local community. So thank you. Um, we have got, uh, we face exciting times as I say, you can follow, we have a website and there's lots of information on our website about the history of the windmill um, and there it is, Brixton Windmill, a bird's eye view of it, nestling only three miles, uh, less than three miles actually from the centre from Charing Cross, uh, surrounded by industrial buildings. But when you come into the park and you sit and look at the windmill, it does feel quite rural. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. That was very interesting and kind of inspiring really that the way you've come from and how you linked everything with the past and today that's really good so thank you very much well i do hope people will come and visit us we yeah. open we're already open we've had our first open of the summer season and um you can find out you've got the details there on the this slide about how you can book to your your um visit or just come along and have a look on days when um, with the mill itself isn't open yeah so thank you very much, and thanks everybody else as well. Is that, are, are, are there any questions? Or has anybody asked any questions? Or have we got time? There, there haven't been any questions in the chat, but if people are, um, we we have a question. Okay. Say so, your so, so, so name. Elijah. And how old are you? Five. No, you're not. You're six. I mean six. <laughs> okay. And what's your question? Um, what were the wheels on the windmill in in one of the early pictures there were wheels on the on the side of the windmill or bicycle wheels. okay that's right there were that was how the cap used to be turned there used to be great pulleys hanging down from the wheels and the you would pull the chain on the uh, that uh, went round the wheel and that would turn the um cap nowadays you we have to climb or a millwright has to climb right up inside the cap and there is a, a, a cranking system a bit um, like, you know, when you used to, which allows you to sort of turn the cap, which is very heavy. Uh, so the whole of that top cap that you can see um, on this slide here, um, turns carrying the very heavy sails and the people inside who are turning it around to face the windmill. It's a very slow process. And usually the wind has moved by the time you get it to the position where you thought it ought to be. So it is quite a difficult process. But when before they had a pulley system, which was more efficient. Thank you. Thanks. There, there is another question I have spotted, actually. 
Um, it says you mentioned the site was bought by Middlesex Hospital. Any idea why? No, I think it was just the freehold that was bought, and I think it just was a commercial thing. Um, uh, they bought it probably along with other things, maybe uh, when because if you rem if you recollect the um, they'd had to remortgage at one point the Ashbys, and they didn't actually own the freehold. The freehold was had a value because as part of their that they paid their rent to the freeholder, didn't they? So 31 pound and 10 shillings every year, which in those days was quite a lot of money, went to the freeholder. So they, but they had to buy the freehold, otherwise they would not have been able to stay. There was a danger that they couldn't, they wouldn't have been allowed to stay in the, in the windmill and use it. Okay, thank you. I think that was the only, unless somebody else has got a question, but. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Very quickly, my name's Doug Hyken and I watched and I enjoyed it enormously, very much. I lived, was born about a hundred meters away from uh, the windmill in a street called Prague Street which has now disappeared, but it's been replaced, I presume, by some sort of center. One thing I'm going to do, I promise, break, drag out all my grandchildren and take them down there and have a good look around where I used to live. And I used to skate up and down the streets and uh, take them to the windmill. And I've enjoyed it enormously. Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's interesting because Prague Street, which is written Prague, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. of and course. I, I, you when I first nowhere. moved here, and someone said, "Where's Prague Street?" I and I knew Prague Place <laughs> because there is a Prague Place on the new estate. Yes. And um, it, it is actually where the, their housing office is. So um, Prague Place does exist. To uh, they used many of the road names from the from the old streets that were just north of the uh, uh, the Ashby's property. That's right. We were about a hundred meters from it. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to say that you didn't mention is I, I moved from Brixton to Morton when I was about seven years old, and this was during the war, and there was um, a barrage, a, 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 um, a barrage balloon that was moored in the in the grounds of the windmill. As well, I, I didn't know that. I used to go up and uh, sh sh my dad used to take me up and. Uh, have a look at it. I'm I'm not sure of the it was there, but I'm I've no idea whereabouts in the grounds because we couldn't get in. But there was it was one of the barrage balloons that were put up during the blitzes, particularly at the beginning of the war. Well, that's really interesting. And I, I mean we'd love you to write in to, and tell us about that. We did in 2013 do a, a an oral history project, and we have produced a little book which is called Mill Memories, which does have some of the memories of people who lived around and lived in those streets the way you lived. Um, but nobody mentioned a barrage balloon to us, amazingly. Um, oh, so yeah. that's something we didn't know about. So please do write in to us. You can write to us at um, um, Brixt, uh, info at brixtonwindmill.org and there, that'll get to us. There was a barrage somewhere in the area and on the way to school, we used to pick up shrapnel from the shells, which had exploded. Yeah. And the kid who won that, you know, the, the prize for the, the one that bought in yeah, the yeah. largest piece of shrapnel. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do know that the, I enjoyed. The, sorry. No, I was just going to say thank you again. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I do know that there some of the outbuildings in the win, uh, of the windmill did get hit by shrapnel. You know, did get some um, uh, damage. Uh, there were quite serious bomb damage in some of the streets around. And some of it did, but fortunately, the windmill itself didn't wasn't affected. Yeah. We we I once went back at Guy Fawkes Day to at my grandparents' house in Prague Street, and my uncle, who worked in Woolwich Arsenal, he got a huge rocket to fire on Guy Fawkes Night, and just before he fired it, my father, uh, as a joke, put a potty on the top of it. It was a firework that came from. It was an, a, a, a marine firework huge um and it went roaring up into the air and we, goodness knows where the little potty went <laughs> i never forgot anyway thank you again thank you 
There might be two more questions, actually. Oh, quickly then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, two more and that's it. Did the windmill only have one set of millstones through its life? No, there is definite evidence that there were two sets. You can see um, uh, in on the mill above the on on the floor that has the millstone on it, the traditional uh, wind-powered millstone. There are two shoots coming down, so the implication is that two sets of stones sat on that on that floor at one point. So, and that would have been um, set, they would all would have been driven by the same shaft, obviously, but it does look as though there might have been two sets of stones there. Okay. Um, it says, you mentioned building some houses nearby. Was the land sold off for workers' housing? No, the, 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 the houses that were built that uh, uh, the original miller, John Ashby, allowed to be built on his um, property were proper villas, you know, they were quite substantial houses. The land where the workers' houses were built uh, that we were just talking about to the north, that was on a different plot of land, it wasn't on his land. Okay, right, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for having the chance to talk to you all, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye. Bye-bye.